the sacred cedar shrine sh uh, suffered quite a bit of damage this spring during the ice storms. The harka itself was untouched, but a tree fell over the torii, breaking it, and the path to the horka and the surrounding area is pretty much impassable due to downed trees and fallen branches. We lost close to 80 trees um, in the area surrounding the uh, shrine itself. So we've moved the horka to a cedar that's closer to the house and in a more accessible area. Sacred trees have a shimanewa, which is a circling or enclosing rope that marks the boundary where the sacred space begins. They usually have shide, which is the lightning-shaped stripes of paper hanging off of them, and other sacred symbols like offerings of grain and tied to them. These things are really fragile, and animals often take the seeds, and the rain washes away the shide. So you really need to replace them regularly throughout the year. In, the, in this case, the Shimenawa that was on the cedar was a couple of years old and needed to be replaced. Now, few people have asked how I make these, so I decided to record how I made this one. The idea of the Shimenawa is that it marks what are called yorishiro, uh, yorishiro, which are the objects or tools capable of attracting and housing spirits. If you have a spoon that you only use to stir coffee with, that is a yorishiro. It's a sacred tool. Um, in our case, the sacred object is a tree. So the tree is called a kodama. It's a sacred tree, and we have many sacred trees on our land. Um, there are many kodamas on our land. Uh, they are what make our Shinto practice on this land special for us and what it's really about. And we have built uh, kodamas where appropriate for those trees. The majority of our festivals and worship are focused on ni uh, kino kami, which is the sacred spirit of trees. You may know these from uh, the movie Princess Mononoke, the uh, Kodama, were the sacred spirits of trees. They don't really do anything for you. They're, they're just a sacred expression of the interface of us, humanity, with, with nature and, and sacred space. The little houses are called Hokoras. Hokoras are small buildings that are built to house the kami, or sacred spirits. We leave offerings for the kami and our ancestors here, and we meditate in front of these places. Originally, these little buildings might have been built to house the tools that were used to maintain shrines, but over time, the buildings themselves have become sacred spaces. If you travel through Japan, you're going to see a lot of these little buildings, little hokoras, uh, hokoras along the road uh, sides, near shrines, near any kind of sacred tree. Um, in Sweden, you'll see them near where there have been avalanches. Uh, in America, you'll see crosses along the sides of roads. In a lot of cases, those are commemorating people who have died. In Japan, these are commemorating events or uh, just the sacred space itself. They're, they're, they're sacred markers. They say, this is a sacred space. Sorry, I have a kitty cat helping me right now. Um, one of the core ideas of Shinto is that we work with nature to identify the places and things that are sacred. For us, it's the trees and, and the natural, natural world around us. But as the communication between our world and the sacred world is not always clear and is open to interpretation and intuition, it's through the repeated actions of words and deeds that we strengthen our communication. And over time, through repeated experimentation and exploration, we and the kami come to an agreement and then the natural world is in harmony with the sacred, and we have identified those places that are particularly sacred to us. And then those places are where we can go and commune with nature. Some, some religions build a church and say, in this church, that is where the sacred things are going to happen. Uh, some religions identify a tree and say, this tree is sacred. This tree is where the sacred things happen. For us, uh, this tree is the oldest cedar in the area, and we believe that it is already a sacred thing. So we're not making it sacred. We're just identifying it as sacred. We are saying to ourselves, this is a sacred thing. And we hope that nature and the kami already also perceive it to be a very special place, a very sacred thing, something unique in its area, uh, unique in its class.
So to give the spirits a place to reside and to help them recognize our intention that this tree is sacred, we've placed this little hokara at the base of it as a physical reminder of the sacredness of the tree and to give the spirits a place to reside so that we have a better chance of communicating with them. One thing that I like about Shinto is that there's this idea of attracting and then capturing the attention of the sacred, of the sacred spirits by saying, we're doing this thing now, we hope that you'll st pause and stay with us for a while. Um, the Shimenawa, the rope, is a part of that language by which we communicate with ourselves, nature, and kami that this place is special. And you'll see these ropes being used throughout Shinto practice to mark off sacred areas or to mark places where, uh, for example, buildings are going to be built to help communicate a boundary with the sacred world. Because where our world and the sacred world meet, that place is sacred in Shinto. So let's begin with the actual creation of the Shimenawa. Um, we're using a hemp rope, which is used on farms near us. We don't have access to rice ropes or to any kind of rice that we could use to make actual ropes. Um, so a hemp rope speaks to my background, to my, my family, to growing up, and to the natural world around us, very much like rice does, rice ropes do to um, the Japanese. And so this is an example of the, the local variance in Shin, uh, Shinto as it happens from place to place around the country. The first thing to do is I, I tie off the, the rope so that when I cut it, it doesn't unravel. And then we're going to intentionally unravel a little bit of it. I'm just using a pair of um, trimming shears for uh, yard work. And that seems to work really well. You can use a knife or anything you want that will cut. Um, I just find that using shears works really well on these thick ropes. This is, I actually got this at Fleet Farm, which is a farm supply store. Um, it's an oil treated rope. Uh, more natural ropes of this size aren't available unless they're nautical ropes, in which case they're, they tend to also be chemically treated. But the chemicals in this is designed to be eaten by cows. So, it tends to be a, a little bit more natural. And then I like to mark off the end of the rope about the length of my forearm. I think that that's a Roman cubit. I'm not sure exactly. But the, um, so they're all about the same length. I go from my elbow down to my wrist and then tie it off with, uh, again, I'm using a hemp twine, which is uh, used for binding um, bales of hay and is actually intended to be ingested by animals. So it's, it's another natural product that really will last about one or two seasons and then it simply rots away. And even if it frays and falls apart, birds will use it as nesting material. So it's, it's a nice natural kind of material. The reason I'm marking off the ends of these ropes is that we're going to fray it then, uh, like you can see to the left of my knee, or I guess to the right of my camera. So then the rope is still pretty much pretty well held together, but then um, we just give it a quick untwist, and it comes apart into its three main strands, and then each of those strands can be untied. To start this, I measured a rope once around the tree, about the length, so that it would hang naturally and, and look nice on the tree and not constrict the tree at all. And then uh, cut three lengths of rope, the same length, all, all equal to that length. And um, as I'm doing this, I should probably mention, you might want to wear gloves. I mean, I grew up on a farm, so this is just, it's second nature to have the slivers from these ropes in my hand. But you will end up with, with cuts and slivers from the, uh, from the, the materials that the rope is made up of. It's, it's, it's a lot of individual strands. It's a little bit like fiberglass at times, but um, this stuff's not so bad. What I'm working with here are um, polymer, polyester, uh, cores. They're used to help the rope work its way through the machines that make it. And uh, I want to cut those up because I don't want to see that showing up in the bird's nest or have some animal ingest it. Those kinds of things can't be digested and can cause a lot of trouble for animals if they, if they ingest it. And since this is outside, we want to make sure that it's, it's safe for all critters. And so I do this to both ends of three ropes about the same length. And again, I've really left about three extra feet of length on the rope. There you can see the old Shimanoa 
Uh, you can see it's quite rotted. But here's the here's the three new ones. And I lay them out, and then I kind of make each one extend beyond the other about a third of the length. The idea is to have the ropes overlapping most of their length, so you'll always have three wound together. But then each one of them moves on to intertwine a different set of ropes. And uh, the first practice I use here is actually twisting them in place. Later on, I'll actually twist them on the tree. But I just basically go by thirds, and I use my own body to measure that. And if you want to twist this on the ground, and this is really what you do if you're going to be hanging this over a shrine or, or as a tori, these kinds of ropes were used as tories. Uh, hung between two trees for, for a very long time in history. So if you want to construct a Shinto shrine of your own, this is all you really need for a tori, is a, is a rope, something that marks off that sacred space. Um, really just begin by securely tying off one spot where the three ropes are together, or if you want to do the whole length, there's three ropes. But I think that if you look at pictures of Shimanawa in Japan, a lot of them are woven together as groups, that, that you can see it goes from a very thin rope to a very, very thick rope. I keep checking to see if it's coming so it's holding. I was going to try to do the audio as I actually did this work, but it turned out that uh, there was enough. We have so many birds in our yard, and it was very windy that day, so it was very, very hard to hear what I was saying. I'm just using a normal square knot to tie those off. And then uh, if you look at, if you see Shimanawa up close in person, you'll see that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of strings holding them together, a great number of strings holding them together. And then just twist in exactly the same orientation as the rope already is, is twining. You'll see that the rope already has a, a, a twist, a direction to its, you know, to, its, to its twist. And then I remembered at this point, of course, that I am working on circuits, uh, sacred space, on sacred objects, so I really shouldn't be wearing shoes. And besides, it's a lot easier to grip this rope with bare feet than it is with shoes. I don't want to step on the shoe now. So, um, and then just keep twisting and twisting and twisting, and you'll end up with a very nice natural kind of, of uh, twist to it, which works very nice. Now this isn't obviously not going to stay. The, the rope will untwist as soon as you get the chance, but if you tie it tightly enough, um, you can start training it to lay in this orientation. And of course, if you're working with a larger rope, this is pretty much it. I mean, if you if you have a stake in the ground at one side with it tied off, you can stake off the other end and then leave it for a couple of days in the sun, and it will take on this shape very nicely, and you'll end up with a really, really good uh, really, really good twist. And you can add more and more ropes, even just using this hemp rope from a hardware store, you can end up with a rope that's a foot in diameter pretty quickly. Rather than wrapping the rope on the ground, the way I prefer to work is by wrapping the rope on the tree itself and weaving it in. And again, working sunlight, clockwise. You'll see three pegs driven into the cedar. Um, this is this is really a personal choice. Um, you can see that the, the old Shimanawa actually left a stain on the tree, but we're really, really careful to make sure that it doesn't constrain the tree or, or pickle the tree and make it too tight. So uh, what I try to do is use as natural a solution I can find. And this tree has some natural knots that uh, where well, there used to be links that I was able to hook these uh, pegs into. I just drilled a hole and drove the peg in. I'm using a pop puller peg, so it's not too hard on the tree, I hope. And uh, certainly this is a much, much better way to do it than working with steel or using a nail or something like that. And these pegs will rot with time. But I think that it's easier for the tree to heal over these pegs than anything else. And by having the pegs, it means I don't have to make the shimanella so tight that it's clinging to the tree. So as the tree expands and contracts um, with, with the weather and with age, um, the shimanawa is only hanging on to it. It's, it's just 
on it. It isn't actually constraining the tree. And so then uh, what I'm doing is each rope goes around the tree once. So there are three pegs equally spaced around the tree. So with each peg, I start a rope, take it once around the tree, weaving it into the rope that's already in place. And I end up with the two hanging ends of the rope there at each end. I never actually tie the rope to itself. I'm just wrapping it in to the uh, uh, wrapping it in to uh, each strand until I end up with three strands. You can use as many strands as you want. I pick three because three is a sacred number, and uh, Wicca is very popular. And we use three Wiccans, and so you know the triple goddess is is very important to us. So anything, anytime you end up with a number choice, there's the Shinto numbers of four and uh, eight, and the Wiccan numbers of two and three. And really, isn't that what religion is all about? Helping you figure out what numbers you should pick out of a group. So here's the first two. I've got the first two done, and we'll be adding the third. And there is so much fiddling that goes on, so much adjusting and changing over time that, you know, here I am obsessing already on how it looks, and I haven't added the third rope yet, and of course adding the third rope completely changes how it's going to look. So let's get that third rope on. So here we're, we're going to add the final rope, and now is the point when it goes from just being a couple of dangling ropes laying around the tree to actually being something a little bit more beautiful and uh, having some of that ancient art. Now, of course, <laughs> I do have a degree in math, but that doesn't mean that I can actually figure out which is the right direction to wind a rope to make it, make it look right. But um, as this third rope starts coming in, you end up entwining the ends of both of the other ropes so that you end up with a very nice very nice look. Um, if you're going to do something that's going to hang for a quarry, you, you, you do want to do it on the ground and um, have something where you can really get a good twist into it. But when it's hanging on the tree, once you get the basic shape, it's very easy to go back afterwards and get the strands to lay into that trough between the two previous strands so that you end up with a really, really nice weave. And it becomes very solid, um, it becomes very, very, very good looking, very, very quickly. You can see there, just running my hand back and forth across, it helps settle everything into a nice, nice shape. And here we are adding the, uh, the third rope is, is on, and I've gotten things, I think, pretty much spaced out the way I want them to. We've got three sets of the, the hanging down ends, and that leaves me the space in between the hanging down ends to add uh, Shide, the, the lightning, lightning bolt shapes, uh, strips of paper. And um, we use offerings of oat, barley, and wheat, and I have a little bit of uh, rice that uh, is grown locally uh, in rice from uh, the Boundary Waters canoe area that, that we get up in, we buy up in Ely. But um, I want to use a grain that's local. Um, I think that one of the appeals of Shinto for me is that it allows itself to be re-expressed locally very easily, that you look to, your, to the space where you are to see how the sacred in nature is working together and how we as humans fit into that space. And I think that agriculture is, is one of the ways that that happens. The grains that make up how we live, the, the bread that we eat, and, and the, the grains that we ferment to make alcohol is an important part of that relationship. You can see I'm putting a lot of torque on here. It, getting these tight and, and secure is actually a lot of fun. It's, it's just it's good for the spirit to um, really crank on those things, um, get them nice and tight. And then again, on the tree itself, the shimenawa isn't tight to the tree. It's only uh, tight to itself. Um, and when it comes time to take these down, normally these little ropes that I'm tying on now, the, the, the twine will have rotted and fallen off, and birds will be using it for uh, 
messy material by the time it's time to replace the shimanoa. But um, if necessary, you can just take a pocket knife and, and trim them, and uh, the, the shimanoa should come off by itself. I've never had to cut a shimanoa. I, and I actually really consider myself very lucky about that, that they've always reached a point where I could, I could pry them open, uh, pry them unwoven using a, a screwdriver or a crowbar or something like that. And again, it's a really a really great opportunity if you're obsessive about making things look the same and getting things to balance. <laughs> and I think I'll stop here and, and show you the end result. And here's the final um, final result. So here's the old Shimeala, and we've got enough new rope left over for maybe another one at some point. These are the tools I use, just some uh, poplar dowels and a saw and mallet to drive them into the tree. Drill and the cutters I use. And this is the final result. Now, this is all work, right? This is this is like hoeing the garden and stuff like that. So we'll actually have a ritual soon that reinvests the shrine and uh, resanctifies it. Because right now, of course, it's in construction mode. And, uh, we'll we'll be doing a reinvestment later this summer. Thanks for watching.